Hi, and welcome again to my videos for Physical Chemistry 1. In the last video, we looked at solutions consisting of a solid or gas dissolved in a liquid, and we also talked about vapor pressure, the pressure exerted by a gas as it escapes from the surface of a liquid. We found out that the vapor pressure decreases when we add a solute to the liquid, and we can express the connection between the concentration of the solute and the vapor pressure of the solvent using this equation, which is called Routes Law. Today, I want to look more deeply at Routes Law. It turns out that Routes Law has lots of practical applications. For example, we can use it to understand how to improve our distillation technique, which is definitely a skill you'll find useful in many of your chemistry courses. One important thing to know about Routes Law is that it describes the behavior of ideal solutions. In an ideal solution, the attraction between each pair of molecules is equal. In other words, two solute molecules attract each other just as much as two solvent molecules, or one of each type. This is similar to the way that an ideal gas behaves. In an ideal gas, the attractions between each of the molecules is assumed to be zero. So, just as in an ideal solution, every pair of molecules attracts each other by the same amount. However, in a solution, the molecules are much closer to each other than they are in a gas, so the attractions between the molecules isn't zero. But just as with ideal gases, ideal solutions aren't always an accurate model of reality. Back when we talked about ideal gases in video 9, we saw that we can describe how close to ideal a gas is by looking at Z, the compressibility factor, which was given by this equation. We saw that for an ideal gas, Z is equal to 1. There's a similar property that we can calculate for solutions, and it's called the activity coefficient. But in order to talk about the activity coefficient, we first need to know about a property called the activity. The activity is just the ratio between the vapor pressure of a component of a solution divided by the vapor pressure of the pure compound. If we rearrange this equation a bit, we can see that it's very similar to Routes Law. As you can see, our equation for the activity has the activity in the position where the mole fraction occurs in Routes Law. So it seems like the activity should just be equal to the mole fraction of a compound. However, it turns out that's only true for ideal solutions. Non-ideal solutions don't quite obey Routes Law, just as non-ideal gases don't quite obey the ideal gas law. We can tell how close to ideal a solution is by taking the ratio between the activity of a compound in a solution and its mole fraction. This ratio is called the activity coefficient, and it has as its symbol the Greek letter gamma. If the activity and the mole fraction have the same value, then gamma is equal to 1, and that tells us that the solution is ideal. The farther gamma is from 1, the less ideal the solution is. This is similar to the compression factor we used for describing gases. The farther z is from 1, the less ideal a gas is. For example, suppose we have a mixture of benzene and water. As you might know, benzene and water form an immiscible mixture. The water molecules are attracted to one another through hydrogen bonds, whereas benzene is a nonpolar molecule, so benzene molecules are only attracted through London dispersion. That tells us that such a mixture should be very far from ideal, so we would expect that the activity coefficient will be much different than 1. Let's see if that's true. The benzene in a benzene water mixture has a vapor pressure of 608 millimeters of mercury when the mole fraction of benzene is 0.191. However, at the same temperature, the vapor pressure of pure benzene is 225 millimeters of mercury. What are the activity and activity coefficient of benzene in this solution? To find the activity, we'll use this equation. If we plug in the vapor pressure of the solution and the pure compound, we find that the activity is 2.70. Now, we'll calculate the activity coefficient using this equation. When we plug in the activity and the mole fraction, we find that the activity coefficient is 14.2. That's very far from 1, and that confirms our expectation that the mixture we're looking at is very non-ideal. 
But to be fair, this was a pretty extreme example. When we talk about solutions, we're usually talking about miscible compounds, not immiscible mixtures like this one. For a solution made of miscible compounds, the activity coefficient will usually be much closer to 1. As it turns out, the activity is also closely related to another property that we've talked about before, the chemical potential. For a solution containing a chemical, A, the chemical potential of A is equal to the chemical potential of a solution of pure A plus R times T times the logarithm of the activity of A. We'll see this equation again in future videos when we start to discuss reactions at equilibrium. It turns out there's a deep connection between the activity of a compound and the equilibrium constant. But there's even more useful insights we can gain from Routes law. As you know, Routes law relates the vapor pressure of a compound to its concentration in an ideal solution. In order to explore this more deeply, let's think about the mole fractions of the two compounds in a binary solution, which we'll call Xa and Xb. However, let's say that those are the mole fractions of the compounds in the liquid phase. As we know, these compounds slowly evaporate, so there's also a bit of compound in the vapor phase. That's the source of the vapor pressure. Let's call the mole fraction of each compound in the vapor phase Ya and Yb. So, for Routes law, we have this equation for the amount of compound A in the liquid phase. Also, from Dalton's law of partial pressures, we know that the mole fraction of compound A in the vapor phase is given by the vapor pressure of A divided by the total gas pressure. Since there are only two compounds in a binary solution, the total gas pressure will just be the sum of the vapor pressure for each compound, so P is just PA plus PB. With a bit of algebra, we can combine all these equations to get some results that will give us insight into some common chemical procedures, like distillation. First, let's use Routes law to rewrite the equation for the total gas pressure. Also, since there are only two compounds in the solution, we know that the mole fractions of the two will add up to 1. So Xb is equal to 1 minus Xa. If we plug that into our equation, here's what we get. Now, let's distribute PB to the term in parentheses. Notice that two of these terms include the mole fraction of compound A. So let's factor that out of those two terms. We can plug that expression for the total pressure into the equation we got earlier for the mole fraction of compound A in the vapor phase. That gives us this rather large fraction. We can also rewrite the numerator of this fraction using Routes law. So this equation gives us a way of determining how much of the vapor phase above a solution is a result of compound A. This is an important quantity to know if you're performing a distillation. If you have a binary solution and you're attempting to distill it, you'd like the vapor to contain only one compound. If it contains both components, then the distillate will be contaminated by the second compound in the solution. We'd like to have Ya, the mole fraction of compound A in the vapor phase, to be as close to 1 as possible so that our distillate will be nearly pure A. The problem with this equation is that it contains two different variables. Xa and Ya can both have many values. Let's try to correct that problem by solving this equation for Xa, since that's the mole fraction of A in the liquid phase, which is much easier to measure than Ya. First, we'll move the denominator to the left side of the equal sign. Now, we'll divide both sides by Ya, and then move PB to the right side and the fraction to the left side. Next, we'll factor Xa from the terms on the left. Finally, we'll solve for Xa, which results in another large fraction. We can simplify the right side a bit by multiplying everything in both the numerator and denominator by Ya. 
Next, we'll factor ya out of two of the terms in the denominator. And finally, let's get rid of the negative sign in the numerator by multiplying both the numerator and denominator by negative 1. So what can we do with this? Well, earlier in this derivation, we had this equation for the overall pressure. We can plug the expression we just got for xa into that equation, which gives us this. But why would we do that? Well, take a closer look at this equation. It contains only one variable. The pressures on the right side are all vapor pressures for a pure sample of compound A or B. The only other item on the right side is Ya, the mole fraction of the vapor phase made up of compound A, which is the only variable on the right side. All the vapor pressures of pure samples are constant. Luckily, we can simplify the expression on the right. First, we'll multiply the first term by a fraction consisting of the denominator of the second term over itself. Now that we've done that, the two fractions have the same denominator, so we can add them. Notice that these two terms are exactly the same. That means they'll cancel out, and we can drop them out of the fraction. That gives us this as a final result. So now, let's review what we got from this long process. We just got this equation for the overall pressure, and earlier we saw this one too. So now we have two expressions that relate the overall pressure to the mole fraction of A. One of them relates the pressure to the mole fraction in the liquid phase, and one does it for the vapor phase. Everything else in these two expressions is a constant. All the pressures are for the vapor pressure of pure samples of compounds A or B, and that's constant. So, what's so interesting about those two equations? Plenty. As we'll see in the next video, we can use those two expressions to understand exactly what happens during a distillation, and they give us some very practical insights on how to make distillations more efficient and increase the purity of our distillate. But we'll get to that in the next video. For now, you've learned how to apply algebra to some fairly simple equations to get very practical results. And with that, we'll take a break. But I hope you'll join me for the next video. Until then, have a good week. <laughs>